Okay, dear friends, so there's obviously a lot going on in the world. And when I say the world, I mean our world, the Jewish world. I'm talking Israel, of course, and for Jews throughout the world. However, there is a concept that history can be learned from. There's a reason we look back at our history, not just because it's interesting, because what's happened in the past happens again in the future. And we are seeing something which is uncanny to what happened to our ancestors, which are being discussed in the parashiot we're in right now. Because the Jewish people are now in the worst galut, exile they had been in up to this point. This is the galut of Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim means, we translate as Egypt, but Mitzrayim also means Meitzer Yam. Meitzer means confined. Yam is Yud Mem, which adds up to 50, Yud and Mem. Because this was not just a physical slavery we were in, a physical galut of pain and torture, which it was. My friends, it was also a spiritual one as well. We went down to almost the 50th level of Tumah, of impurity. We reached the 49th, which we're going to talk about today, and it was really bad. That means we were suffering on many levels. And it's the same for us today. We're suffering physically. Every day we hear about the tortures and the terrible stories coming out of the news that's happening to our people. But at the same time, for most of us, we're not going through the physical anguish. We're going through the emotional, psychological torture that comes with it. So there's two different planes over here, and both are going to be spoken about in the Egyptian redemption, <coughs> and I'm going to bring it right up to date in our redemption as well, because what happened to them, Bayamahem, Bazman Hazer, is what's happening to us in our day as well. So let's get going. We know the Jewish people had been in Egypt for hundreds of years, and they reached the lowest level that our nation could reach without being completely assimilated into their society. And they cried out to Hashem, which is, remember, always the reason why we go through challenging circumstances. You may not want to hear it, but it's the truth. One of the main reasons God puts us into these very difficult times is that we have an opportunity to cry out to Hashem and thereby build our relationship. That means there'd been a loosening of our relationship to Hashem. And by crying out to Hashem, we bring ourselves closer. That was true for the Avot, and it's true for the Jewish people, as they are in Egypt, and it's true today. It's true today. That's why prayer has become so prevalent, and song of prayer has become so prevalent for our people, which in and of itself is a good thing. Anyway, so Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, go tell Paro, right, that I am going to come in, right, and I'm going to take the Jewish people out. So he's going to let them go. It's time to go. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, but are they going to believe me? And he says, they're going to believe you. And here are a few proofs you can bring to him. You would have thought, after God says to you, go in, right, I'm God, and tell them that I'm going to get them out, everything would become fantastic. I mean, hello, who is going to argue with God? Well, actually, a lot of people, then and now. This is not a new story. And not only do things stay the same when Moshe Rabbeinu goes in to get the Jewish people out, they actually get considerably worse. If you remember the story, in goes Moshe Rabbeinu. He says, okay, Paro, let my people go. They don't want to be slaves anymore. And he says, not only are you going to have to keep building and being slaves, you're going to have to find the straw and collect the mud to make your own bricks in order to build all these buildings that we need in Mitzrayim. So we went from bad to worse. And that's after Moshe Rabbeinu went in and did exactly as God had told him. After that, what would you expect Moshe Rabbeinu's response to be to God? What would you expect any normal person? He'd be really upset. And he was. And he says, Hashem, God, what, what did you do? You told me to go in. I don't want to go. I don't think the people would believe me. I don't think power would believe me. You showed me these signs. I went in. I spoke to him. 
and it went from bad to worse. Now the people are really upset with me, and they're being tortured even more, so they're physically terrible, and spiritually, psychologically, it's getting really, really, really bad. And Moshe Rabbeinu, and that sounds weird, actually, to some degree, lose this temple. Looks like the words themselves. For Yeshev Moshe Hashem, God turns, Moshe turns around to Hashem and says, Vyoma Adonai Lam Maherota La'am Why did it make it so bad? You made it really bad for that. It was bad before. You, God, just made it worse. Wow. That's a big statement. What do you think God's reaction is? when you get angry with God? It's a good question, right? Because we've all felt any Jew with any form of conscience, any person with any form of conscience should feel a little bit of like anger and bitterness at what's happening today and every day for weeks now and months. What's happening to our people? What is God's response? So the first thing that God does is when we get angry is it's going to be okay. I'm going to take him out. He said to Moshe, Atatera, you're going to see. Ashesta, what I'm going to do. Don't worry. You're going to see that everything is going to work out great. We're going to get out. It's tough. I know it's tough. And it was bad. And it's worse. But it's going to be okay. These words are very consoling, not just to Moshe, but to every other galut, every other exile that we've been through. It was bad. It's going to get better. It may get worse. But even that worse is a temporary phase that we are going to go through. In other words, after October 7th, we're like, it can't get any worse. And it did. And it still may do. But we have to remember that there's a God in charge of everything and everyone. The whole thing was predicted by our prophets, and it's all meant to be. It's unpleasant, but for some reason, and we'll see in the future why it had to be. Now, had it left at that point, would it be like, fine. So God's like, I understand you're upset, right? I know things are bad. I know they could just got worse because of me, says Hashem, right? I mean, I'm not have told you to go and it got worse. But then he says something very unusual. And now we're going to have to get a little bit deeper to figure out different words that are used. Watch carefully. Then he says, opening up this parsha, Vaidaber Elokim El Moshe. Now, what does the word Vaidaber mean? In that famous verse, Vaidaber Adonai El Moshe probably the five most commonly repeated words in the entire Torah. Vaidaber Lemor. What's the difference between Vaidaber, Ledaber, and Amira, Lemor something, to say something? They're both saying. Very famous question. And the rabbis tell us a beautiful answer. They're like, Daber is a hard word. That means someone is saying something. That's harsh. Vaidaber Hashem Moshe. When God spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu, many times the word daber, kashek gidin, tough like sinews. When he gave the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu, he gave it harshly. But then he says, but don't forget, Vaidaber Hashem El Moshe Limor. When you, Moshe Rabbeinu, tell Torah to everyone else, don't use Vaidaber. Because they can't, you can handle it, Moshe. But they can't handle it. You've got to do it with Lashon. Rach. Be nice. When you teach Torah, don't shout and scream and, and, and castigate and be mean and nasty. That's not the way Torah should be taught. It may be how many of you learned Torah growing up. I know I had a number of Abanim who did speak that way. And I'll be honest with you, it turned a lot of people off. Because that's not the way Torah should be taught. Torah should not be Vaidaber. It should be Emor. And that's what that verse means. Vaidaber Hashem Moshe Lemor. When you tell the Jewish people, don't do it with Daber, do it nicely. Talk sweetly. Make them want to hear your words. You're going to have to bring them in with your lovely, sweet ideas and thoughts and tongue. That's what they want. But right now, Hashem is using double strength. Vaidaber Elohim. What's Elohim? What is that name of God? Elo with a him at the end. What does the word El mean? Power. Power. What's Yud Mem at the end of a word? It's plural, yeah. So how can God's name be plural? There's only one God. So what this word actually means is the power behind all powers. That's what the name Elohim actually means. It's a very powerful name. You don't pray to Elohim, you pray to Hashem. 
Who is Hashem? We're getting there one second. He's about to introduce himself for the first time. Listen carefully. So, Vidaber Elokim. So he speaks to Moshe, he's like, Vidaber Elokim. He's upset with him. Why? Rashi tells us. Because you got upset with me, I'm going to have to relate to you the same way. God is like our shadow. When we get angry with Hashem, which happens, we get frustrated. Hashem is like, then I'm going to have to talk back to you the same way. Because that's not the way our relationship is meant to be. You're meant to realize that everything that happens is ultimately for the good. As Rabbi Akiva taught us, called Avrahman at Everything that God does to us is for the good. You may not see it now, but it is. By the way, as a side, I must mention, because these are hard times in the Torah and hard times in life, I must mention a very, very famous dispute between two great rabbis. Actually, one of them was a rabbi of another. Rabbi Akiva. And who was Rabbi Akiva's rabbi? Nachum Ish Gamzu. That was his teacher and his rabbi. And Rabbi Akiva, there's a very famous story that he went through very challenging times when the Romans wanted to kill him and he was being chased and he ended up sleeping in the middle of a forest, freezing cold, and he had, a, he had animals that were killed and a candle, one fire that went out and he said, Look, everything that God does, called the Rahman Atabi, everything God does is for the good. Nachamish Gamzu, his rabbi, was greater than him because he said, Gamzu Latova. His name wasn't Gamzu, they used to call him that. There's actually streets in Israel called Gamzu. Gamzu Latova, everything's for the good. What's the difference? There's a big difference. Nachamish Gamzu was saying that this is good. Rebbe Kiva's like, no, this is bad, but it will be good. Nachamish Gamzu was this, you may not see it right now because of all the challenges we're going through, but Gamzu, this zoo, this is good. Not that it will be good, which is Rebbe Kiva, which is a slightly lower level, but impressive. I'm not putting Rebbe Kiva down in any way, shape, or form, heaven forbid. I wish I had that level where I could say it. I really know, not believe, I know it's going to be good. That's Rabbi Akiva. His teacher was, no, this is good. You just don't see it. And that's pretty much what's happening in this dynamic. He's like, Moshe Rabbeinu, you talk to me that way, I'm going to have to talk to you the same way. Right? Because what you give out comes back to the same way. And Hashem got upset with him and said, don't talk that way. It's going to be good. I told you, it's going to be good. It may get worse, but it will be good. But Moshe Rabbeinu was feeling the pain of his people. That's what he's re relating to. And then he says, by the way, Ani Hashem, I am God. What kind of way is that to finish a verse? Of course you're God. Who's he talking to? He's been talking to God since the, the burning bush when he got his mission, right? It was a seven-day conversation. I mean, Ani Hashem. What is Ani Hashem? What does it say? It says about a number of places in the entire Torah. I am God. I'll give you two interpretations, my friends. They're both very, very important. Ani Hashem. The Yud with the He and the Vav with the He is God's name of mercy, Rachamim. He's like, I'm talking to you harshly, but that's not the, the real me that you want to turn to right now is Yud with the He and Vav He. Those four letters are actually three words. Haya was. Hove is. Yia will be. When you crunch those three words together, haya, hove, yeah, you get yud with a hey and a vav and a hey. That's God's name of Rachamim. So he's like, it's true. It may look like Vaidaber or Kim, and I'm going to talk to you that way because you spoke to me that way, but that's not who I am. It's going to be okay. The struggles we went through in Egypt, the struggles we're going through right now, we have to read these verses and say, Ani Hashem. By the way, Ani Hashem has another interpretation. Not only that God operates on a level of judgment and mercy, but also, Ani Hashem also means, I'm God. I know what you're thinking. I understand. I get you. Humans don't always get each other. There's parts of us we don't want to reveal, but one of the principles of our faith, and one of the, actually the Rambam says, one of the 13 principles of Ikra and Munah, of belief in Judaism, is that God knows the thoughts that we think. We're not judged by those thoughts, thank goodness, because <laughs> that'd be a big problem, right? But God does know them and understands us and wants us to do well. So he says, Ani Hashem, I know what you're thinking, I know what's inside you, even that aspect of your thinking, I'm telling you, it's gonna be okay. Everything is going to get better. 
He said that to Moshe, and I'm telling that to you. It's going to be okay. It may get a little worse, but we will not be wiped out. We will survive this because there was a promise given to Avram and Yitzhak and Yaakov that we would get out, that we would exist as a people, that would get the land of Israel, we'll get to keep it, land of Israel is going to get much, much bigger, and we're going to be redeemed with the Mashiach. Well, shouldn't Hashem mention that in this conversation? He does. Check this out. He says, you know, my relationship to the Avot, to Avram, Isaac, and Yaakov, was very, very different to what it's going to be like when I relate to you as an entire people, as an um. You see, when I was dealing with them, I didn't, well, what's written in the Torah are no open miracles. If you notice, the start of open miracles begins right now. Because that's Hashem's mercy. Yud with a hay and a vav and a hay. Now, there may have been some open miracles, but they're not mentioned in the Torah. For example, we know that um, Abraham was thrown into a fiery furnace by Nimrod and he survived. But that's in the Midrash. That's not written in the Torah. We only start to see open miracles right now when we have an entire nation that could relate and react to them. And that's going to be a very important prelude to what's about to come. So now Hashem turns around to Moshe and says, by the way, let them know that the Yud and Hey and Vav and Hey, which the Avot, which we're probably aware of, but they didn't relate to me in that way. The relationship to me was Kale, Aleph, and Lamed, Shakai, right? Shin with the Dal and Yud. That the God that says that's enough. There's a limit. There's a limit to what I'm going to do while they were alive. But once the Jewish people turn up and we're about to leave Egypt, it becomes limitless. And that is Hayah over Yeah. God is outside of time. He's not constricted. He's past, he's present, he's future. Are we together? I know we're going deep tonight, but you look like you're deep people. Let's go even further, because this is really important to where we are now. So, you would have thought that God would console him and say, it's true that my relationship to the Avot and Ema'at, the forefathers and foremothers, was in one way, and the Jewish people is another, but you should know something very important. I'm telling you right now that they also are going to be part of this. How can they be? They're dead. Check this out. It says, you know what? I'm going to keep the Brit, the, not the British person, the Brit, the promise, itam, with them, I'm going to give, how do you say you, plural in Hebrew? How do you say you, plural in Hebrew? Lechem. Lechem. It doesn't say that. It says, Lahem, I'm going to give them the land of Israel. Why doesn't he just say, I'm going to give you? At this point, these are the people who are going to go into the land of Israel. So why does it say, Lahem? Here, the Gemara learns out something very important. I'm going to just mention it. It's a whole sugi, a whole idea of itself, which we won't discuss right now because it's too big. However, they learn from here, and this is one of the hints in the Torah of Tchiat HaMitim, of the resurrection of the dead. You see, if Avraham, Isaac, and Yaakov were promised the land of Israel, and they didn't really get to inherit it in a real way, right? So it's not fair. It is as though God, quote-unquote, lied to them. He's like, no, I didn't. Because they're going to get it in the future. Because they're going to resurrect at some point after Mashiach comes. When? We're not too sure. There's not much written on this. A few verses in the prophets. There's a lot written on Mashiach and the end of days. Very little written on resurrection of the dead. We're not sure when precisely, who, and even how is shrouded in mystery. But it is a principle of our faith. You must believe in it. And this is one of the proofs to it. And it's hinted at. It's not explicit because it's not. The Torah only talks about things that we can understand, like the mitzvot or stories from the past. But some of the resurrection of the dead and Mashiach that hasn't happened yet is not mentioned explicitly in the Torah, but it is hinted at. And this is one of the most famous hints in the entire Torah that the ancestors who didn't get to enjoy the land of Israel and walk around and enjoy it with the Torah is going to come back. And they're going to get to enjoy it. So he's like, you know what? It's not just you. I'm not just talking to you, Moshe, I'm talking to all the Jewish people right through history that we're all going to go back and enjoy the land of Israel together. The past people, the present and the future ones too. 
It's pretty consoling. I'll be consoled if God told me that directly. Well, he is. He's telling us that in the Torah. So that's exactly what's happening. Okay? And he's like, I've heard. I know what they went through. So there's a shift. There's a shift from Elohim, God's attribute of judgment, of justice, which we said is just part of the world. That's the way that God made the world. Right? You put your hand on fire, it gets burned, whether you regret it or not. You drink poison, you die. It's just the way it is. That's Elohim. The laws of nature are set. But there's another aspect that's added right now, and it's going to be that way till the end of days, which is Yud, K, Vav, Hey, which is God is merciful. And it's like, that's my real, and that's how I want you, Moshe Rabbeinu, to relate to the Jewish people, and that's the way we today need to relate to Hashem more now than ever before. Because you can look at God and be like, oh my God, God is terrible, He's supposed to hurt us, right? And it's like, no, that's not the way it is at all. It's really not the way it is. And that's what we're being told, and that should console us today. Anyway, let's go a little bit further. I want to talk about one metaphor, and then we'll talk about four words. So one metaphor, four words. And it goes like this. There's a very famous metaphor that is mentioned many times in the parasha, and many parashiot, actually. And of course, it's one of the big themes of the Pesach Haggadah, right? which is basically the retelling of this story and a lot more. And what is that? That God himself is going to go into Egypt and he's going to stretch out his arm and take the Jewish people out. What is that whole metaphor of Zeroa Netuya? God stretched out arm. Why do I need to know that? Just say, God's going to take you out. Is that enough? Oh, you're stuck in a, I don't know, a, a dead-end job. I'm like, I'm going to rescue you. How? I'm going to come in, I'm going to reach out my arm, you're going to grab my hand, and I'm going to take you out. I mean, it's very, very poetic, right? And very metaphorical. But what is that? What does that even mean? I'm asking a bigger question, by the way. And I've got a very deep answer, which can really change the way you understand a lot of concepts in Judaism, by the way. Why do we give God physical attributes? Why do we give God the idea of the eye of God, right? Or the hand of God, what we're seeing here. Or the foot of God. What does that even mean? And even more, there is ad- God gets angry. God doesn't get angry. Why are we giving God these anthropomorphic, which is a fancy way of saying, these human attributes? Why are we doing that? Why is that mentioned over here? Why do we need to know that? Why do we know that God is going to go in and take us out, right, with this Zoroa Natuya, with the stre- outstretched arm? I was always puzzled by this. I'll let's give you a couple of answers, but I'm sure there's many, many more. One is, and this is pretty obvious, which I'm sure most of you are thinking, just the way we understand things, right? The hand, right, if I said I'm going to use my hands, it means I'm going to do something physical. It's going to be something powerful. The eye... Right, God's eye probably refers to God sees all. God knows all. And God's foot, as it were, God can be anywhere. Right? He's able to move around. And that's probably how most of you understand those words. Yeah, It's just the Torah speaks Belashon Adam in the language of humans. So we can relate. Because I can't understand God. It's too much. I can understand um, judgment of God because, you know, we've got parents who got upset with us. I can understand the mercy of God because I have parents who are very merciful towards me. That I can understand. But the idea of God being all-powerful or knowing my parents on that at all, it doesn't go that far. But what I can do and what I can say is, ah, oh, there's something called the hand of God. Okay, oh, I, I get that. I can relate to that. I, I can, I can kind of get it. So what it means as a metaphor is, God himself is going to come in. By the way, why did God, as a side point, why do we need God himself to do it as opposed to who? <laughs> if God's going to rescue us, who else is going to do it? So the answer is the angels. Or we could fight our way out. But we really know that's not going to be the way we get out. It's going to be amazing, miraculous, right? Because it's Hashem doing it. But he could have sent in angels. And supposedly that's the way it was normally done. And the Avod used to use angels to do stuff as well. We know the Yaakov sent angels to deal with Esav, so we know that angels we use, so God could send in angels, whatever this means, right? These shaluchim, that's why, right? A malach is an angel from the word malacha, right? They get a job done. They're shaluchim. They work for us. 
God uses them to work for us. But he says, no, I can't send an angels. I'm going to do it myself. So on a surface level, that's because Hashem loves us. He's like, I'm going to come in myself. This is going to build a personal I'm not going to send a third party or a fourth party or a 150th party. I'm coming in myself. I'm like, oh, now I feel close to you. But there's something even deeper than that. The Arizal says that Egypt, we already mentioned, was an extremely difficult, defiled place. So bad that had the angels gone in, even they would have been negatively affected by the spiritual tuma impurity that was in Egypt. I do not understand those words, but that's what he says. Therefore, he says, I'm going to spare the angels, but I'm going to come and get you myself. A couple of answers just to that one piece. But let's go back to the original question. Why do I need these physical attributes? It helps me understand stuff, but, you know, we're not that stupid. We understand that God is everywhere. We all learn that as kids. Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is everywhere. Up, up, down, down, right, left, on, around. If he wants to take me out, he can't. He created the world. He can squish the Egyptians. Right? He's able to do that. So why does he use these anthropomorphic, <laughs> these human attributes? So I want to share with you a beautiful idea, which I want to take with you, because it has significance to where we are right now as well. And it goes like this. You see, the problem is, when we hear of God's outstretched arm, or his seeing eye, or his foot, regal Hashem, Yad Hashem, or his attribute of jealousy, right? Kel nekamot Hashem, or his attribute of anger, Af Hashem. It's not saying that these are attributes that we humans have, and therefore a metaphor is given about God to help us understand it. It's not that at all. It's actually the other way around. And this is what Rav Chaim Velozhina says. But it's mentioned in a number of sources. When it says the hand of God, which it does, it actually means that God has a hand. That's a big thing to say. Because God is not physical in any way, shape, or form. That's true. But he has a hand. It's not physical in any way, shape, or form. But it's a real hand. Because the real world is the spiritual world and not the physical world. So God has a real hand. Well, what does it look like if it were physical? And the answer is like this. This, your hand that you use with your five fingers, is actually a physical representation of a spiritual hand. Not the other way around. The real hand that you and I and everyone has is actually spiritual because we're spiritual beings. We're just given a hand for, you know, 120 years. But your real hand is spiritual. So what's this? This is a metaphor. For what? For your real hand. In other words, if you were to take a spiritual hand and make it physical, that's what it looks like. If you were to take a spiritual eye, which you have, to see things in a spiritual way and make it physical, that's what it'll look like. We, my friends, are walking metaphors for the spiritual world. So Hashem is actually telling Moshe Rabbeinu, by the way, make no mistake, this rescue that's going to happen is not a physical rescue. And it wasn't. They didn't fight out their way out. They just walked out. Hashem is like, I'm going to go in with my hand. What hand is that? Like the real hand. You mean this hand? No, 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 no. That's just to show you. This hand over here, and this knee, and this elbow, and this eye, right? That's just there as a metaphor to help you understand the spiritual. You're looking at the wrong way around. We actually are spiritual beings. And God gave us physical form from the spiritual. So once again, it's not that we're physical beings and a spiritual metaphor is used. We're spiritual beings and a physical metaphor is used as well which is why one of my great Kabbalistic teachers from many years ago, actually passed away a few years ago, used to say, even God's name, the Yud, and the He, and the Vav, and the He, if you put it downwards, Yud, He, with a Vav and a He, you get the Yud on top, you get the He, you get the Vav and the He. And the Yud is like the head, right? Which is the highest part, that's the Yud. And the next one of the arms, that's the He. And the Vav is the spine, 
and the hay at the bottom are the legs. It's almost like the imprint of all mankind. Maybe a stick figure, but it works. The imprint of all mankind and all humanity and everything in this world comes from that one name. It's the blueprint by which humans were made from. And there was no more merciful act than the creation of mankind and the creation of mankind over here as well, by the Jewish people. So that's what Hashem is saying. He's like, tell them, I'm coming. Who? Me. Anivala Malach. Anivala Shilech. Anivala Saraf. Me, I'm not an angel. I'm not a third party. Not a fiery angel, whatever that is. Scary. I'm not that at all. It's me, myself. But you're not physical. You don't need to be physical because you're a spiritual nation. And that's how you have to relate to the world in every circumstance you're being in. So this slavery, right, and this torture we're going through today, 2023 slash 2024, is not by coincidence. It's all there for a spiritual reason and a spiritual purpose. And this then goes a little bit further when Hashem says, by the way, I'm even going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, says Hashem, how I'm going to take them out. It's going to be a four-phased plan. Four parts to this redemption. What we call the Dalud L'Shonot of Gula, of redemption. The four languages or expressions of redemption. And he says, you should know. I'm going to use this hand. I am go. Sorry, let's go back. I'm going to take you out. Misivlot Mitzrayim. Sivlot means burdens, but that's a very interesting and unusual word to use over here. Vitzalti, I'm going to save you. I'm going to take you out. I'm going to save you, Etchem. Mi avodah tam for that. Vegaalti, I'm going to redeem you, right, with this whole outstretched arm. And lekachtechem, I'm going to take you to me. So you have four words. We have hotzeiti, we have hitzalti, gaalti, and lekachti. Those are the four. What are these four words? Just say, I'm going to take you out. What are these? So these are four phases, according to one opinion. First of all, they said we were taken out of these slaves because six months before we left Egypt, there was no more slavery. That means in Tishrei, right, because that's six months before Nisan, there was no more slavery. So we were no longer slaves. And then we were taken out physically. That is the Hitzalti. We were saved by being taken out of Egypt. Then we got to the Red Sea seven days later, and we were redeemed. That is the Ga'alti. And Lakakhti, taken to me, is 50 days later from leaving, which is Har Sinai. Okay. But others disagree or say there's another piece over here. Those first two words don't make sense in that order. Because the Hotseti means I'm going to take you out. What does that actually mean? Take you out. Well, once I'm out, I'm okay, right? It's all good. Once you're out of prison, you're out. You're not worried about getting out because you are out. So that's the end of it. So why does it say, I'm going to take you out? Vitzalti, I'm going to save you. It's very strange. So the rabbis say another interpretation, which is really important to our thinking today. Vitzalti and Hitzalti are actually two types of redemption from terrible circumstances. In this case, Egypt. In our case, Hamas, which is... First of all, we have to take our head out of being victims. That's how it started. Before God took us physically out, there had to be a prelude, which is, I'm going to take you mentally out. You're going to have to mentally prepare yourselves for this exit. And by the way, not everyone in those days were able to do this. We know that only a fifth, Chamushim Yalu, a fifth of the Jewish people got out. One of the other four-fifths, they couldn't fathom what was happening. They couldn't understand it. It was so bad, and they felt that they were Egyptians. Like you hear the stories of the Jews in the Holocaust, right? Who were proud Germans, and they just couldn't get it. Like, how could this happen? And many of them fought in the First World War, and probably were ready to register for the Second World War. And yet, you're doing it to us. There was a mental game. And therefore, winning over this galut, and that one especially, but this one as well, is you're going to have to fix your head. Understand that it's happening for a purpose and that we're going to be taken out. So that actually is the 
Votiti. You've got to get out of your bad thought patterns. A mental redemption you're going to have to bring upon yourself. Once you go through that, then you're ready to leave. And most were not able to. Most were not able to. What about today? You think most people are able to mentally understand what's happening to our people? Are we able to really fully download the atrocities? Some people are. And I mentioned it before, I mentioned it again. My wife comes from a Holocaust family, right? These things happen, and she grew up. People who come from Holocaust families, which I don't because I'm Sephardic, but my wife did. This is part of the conversation. They're going to come and try to kill us again. Right? Behold door of a door. What are you talking about? We say every Pesach. She's not surprised at all. The savagery, I understand. But there's been many savages before this. The Babylonians are bad to us. The Romans are bad to us. The Greeks. The Nazis. Hamas. It's the same thing. It's like the Holocaust never ended. It's just a continuation. And therefore, it's horrible and nasty. And it, but if you have history on your side, you're able to put some perspective that, oh yeah, we've been through worse before and we got out because God is the merciful one and we will be taken out. That's a guarantee. We are going to win this. If you don't have Jewish history on your side or an understanding, even a, a five-year-old's understanding of Hashem, I don't know what you're believing. Yeah, they're going to overtake us and that's the end of it. And we'll just melt away. There are people who really believe this. Or we'll take the sides of our enemies saying, you know, they're right. It must be they're right. right? Now, all of you, and hopefully people watching this at home, when you hear that, like, how can it be? How can someone, how can a Jew, forget about a Jew take the side of our enemies, especially now? Right? You're like freaked out by that. But don't be, because it's happened before. You know, it happened in Purim too. And it happened in Greece. I know we talk about the Hanukkah story as though Greeks against Jews that's the sanitized version. What it actually was, was Jews against Greeks, and then Jews against Jewish Greeks. That's what it really was all about. We don't want to talk about it. It doesn't sound very nice. Fortunately, there's been an awakening in the Jewish world, more so in Israel than in Chosla Aras and outside of Israel, especially in America. But even here, you're seeing it. People who've never affiliated with being Jewish suddenly are waking up. Because right? some people, what well, gets them excited Jewishly, right? It's like a nice Devat Torah, right? A nice Cholent or a Choresh and Nira and Shabbat and that, and they feel good. Some people need anti-Semitism. That's when they turn on. Right? Think about it. Just go to Twitter for even two minutes. Don't spend more than that a day on it. And you see, some people who've never mentioned they were Jewish before, suddenly, I'm a proud Jew. There's a very famous British comedian who most people didn't even know was Jewish. Named Stephen Fry. Never Jewish. He, talk, he calls himself an atheist. And he came out with a video, and he's talking with great pride about being Jewish, how he is a Jew. Believe me, I'd never heard him ever talk like that in decades. And suddenly, a little bit of anti-Semitism, throw him in the fiery furnace, poof, out it comes. It's sad that that's what it takes, but for a lot of people, that's what it takes. These four expressions, therefore, are not just cute words. They're phases, but they're also teaching us that redemption and survival at the hardest times, and for us, that's what this really involves, is going to be our heads. We're going to have to get our heads into this. We're going to have to realize that we are going to survive. You've got to know it. You've got to know it. There's another level. You've got to know that everything that Hashem does, called Avrahman, everything that God does is for the good. That's what Rabbi Kiva told us. I mean, we're not the level of his rabbi, Nochemish Gamzu, that this is good, that I can't see. I'm sorry, maybe some of you are. I'm not that level. I'm like, this is horrible. This is really bad. But eventually we'll see why it happened and it's for the good. If you could just get that piece down, Dayenu, what do we do to celebrate these four experiences? Because we celebrate all of them. We drink four cups of wine. The four cups of wine we drink at the Pesach Seder come keneged, correspond to these four expressions. But there's another cup, isn't there? Is there another cup at the Pesach Seder? Yeah, you know it. What's it called? 
the cup of Eliyahu, kos shel Eliyahu. Hmm, that's interesting. What cup is that? And what do we do with it? We fill it up. To where? To the tippy top. Actually, you're meant to use a bigger cup for that cost, for that cup. And it's going to sit in the middle of your table. And it's very difficult for you, but you can't drink it. You can shake the table a bit, right? As though Elia Novi's drank some of it, but he hasn't drank any of it. But not yet. You see, that fifth cup is a cup that we haven't drunk yet and we don't drink because that redemption has not happened. Well, what redemption is that? The coming of Mashiach, the final redemption. So that's a bigger cup that we don't drink yet, but we will drink that cup. That means there's going to be a Pesach Seder, and God willing, it may be this Pesach, where you're going to get to be able to drink that fifth big cup of wine. Well, God willing, where is that? Shouldn't there be a fifth expression in the story? Is there one? Yeah, there is. And what's that? There's a fifth word, which is Heveti, very nice. I'm going to bring you. Veveti. I'm going to bring you etchem el ha'aretz to the land. Asher nasati ad yadi. You're going to come in there. So when Moshe Rabbeinu heard it, he was like, oh great, we're all going to go to Israel. All right? And that's what he was told to tell the Jewish people. And by the way, when it was said to Moshe Rabbeinu, it was meant. Because at this point, they were meant to all go, that means the Jews in Egypt, to Israel. Okay, we had a bit of a problem with the golden calf and the spies, right? So they forfeited their right to inherit Israel at this point. But the Heveti actually, said the rabbis, is the fifth expression that hasn't happened yet. And that's why there's a fifth cup. And that fifth cup actually represents the final redemption, which is going to be bigger and better than this one that we're reading around now. That's number five. Interestingly, five cups sounds very much like five fingers on your hand. Right? Five fingers on your hand. And this is hinted at as well. And where is it hinted at? At a conversation between two people who didn't live at the same time. So I don't understand precisely how this conversation happened, but supposedly it did. And this conversation was between Yaakov, Jacob, remember, whose descendants were going to go into Egypt and be redeemed, and Eliyahu, who's going to be the one who's going to turn up at your Pesach Seder, right, fifth cup, and tell us we're going to go. So Yaakov was worried. He was like, look, this final exile, it's just going on and on, and it's getting worse and worse. Spiritually, it's getting worse, and physically now, right? It's getting worse and worse and worse. There's got to be an end. He's like, Elio, please, promise me there's going to be an end. And he's like, okay, I promise, because not enough. I need you to, to shake my hand. What? Why are you going to shake my hand? They don't live at the same time. He's like, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to take from you five fingers. Which letter looks like a finger? The vav. The vav. Letter vav. And that's why you'll see Eliyahu's name is mentioned five times. Chaser vav. Lacking a vav. And Yaakov's name is mentioned five times with an extra vav. Yaakov with the vav in it. You don't need the vav in order to make the name Yaakov work. Jacob. You don't need it. So Yaakov was telling Eliyahu, you know what? Give me your five vavs. Give me your hand and shake. Give me a promise. Swear in a Bible if you want. Whatever it is. Promise me that one day you're going to come and you're going to mention the redemption and that's why I need you at every Pesach Seder, because that's us talking about this redemption. But that's not enough, because we're still in Galut. So turn up at Pesach Seder, see how we're still doing our Pesach Seder, and then take us out. And is it a coincidence, thinking about it now, that on Tishrei it started, the redemption, and ended on Nisan, 
and wow, on Tishrei, all of our problems started now, and God willing, a six-month period till Pesach, maybe, God willing, if we're worthy, maybe there's a window of opportunity in the build-up and on Pesach itself that this is the final redemption of our people. Maybe the same pattern that happened over here in Tishrei, it all kicked in and we started to see wonders and then it ends up, because it got bad, right? But then the redemption came six months later. Maybe we're going to follow the same pattern this year, Bizarat Hashem. Tov Shin Pei, Dalad, Podeh, Redemption. That'd be nice. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, that would be very, very good. And so that's where we are. Right now, we're waiting for the fifth redemption. We've been doing the four for millennia, right? The four cups. But we're not happy with that. We want to bring the final one, the Hamsa, the last one into play. God, we get to drink the big and final cup that comes with our redemption as well. Promise to Moshe Rabbeinu, promise to the Avot, and we want God not to use the Elohim version. We want the Yud with the Hay and the Vav and the Hay version, the nice, merciful and miraculous version, as the prophets, some of the prophets, describe the final redemption of Mashiach coming, and then God willing, we'll be able to kick in to the final of Haveti. We're all going to go back. Tchertamitim, resurrection of the dead. The Avot are going to be able to actually enjoy the land of Israel freely the way they were meant to back then, together with the Jewish people, with a complete redemption, like God willing, very, very soon. We'll stop over there. We have a few minutes. If anyone has any questions on anything we discuss, don't have to be shy. But you know it all. It's fantastic. Baruch Hashem. Okay. The food's coming out in a few minutes. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this.